after Patrick Moore contemplates a galaxy in creation in a remote part of the sky at night. Good evening. In July, I went to Mexico to observe a total eclipse of the sun. This happens when the moon passes in front of the sun and blots it out, so that for just a few minutes we can see the sun's atmosphere, or corona, and the masses of glowing red gas, which we call prominences. Well, I took some photographs, but I'm going to show you two better ones. This was taken by Dame Kathleen Olinshaw, actually from Hawaii. You see the corona very well, and there, reckoning about half past eleven on a clock face, you can see one of the prominences. And this lovely photograph of the diamond ring effect was taken by Douglas Arnold, and the sun is just starting to reappear from behind the dark body of the moon. And I can assure you, a total solar eclipse is a superb sight. Roll on the 11th of August, 1999, when the track of totality will cross Cornwall. From there, I went down to Buenos Aires in Argentina for the meeting of the International Astronomical Union, or IAU. This is the controlling body of world astronomy, and it meets every three years in different places. On this occasion, I had been asked to edit the daily bulletin issued to all the delegates, so I had to be there. It was a very interesting conference, particularly right at the end when the conference centre caught fire, but it was dominated by one startling announcement, that of the discovery of a planet going round a neutron star. Now, this was very odd indeed, because we believe that a neutron star is the remnant of a supernova explosion, which is incredibly violent and would be expected to destroy any planet within range. In fact, a neutron star is the very last kind of object you'd expect to be the centre of a planetary system. Obviously, we can't see it. Uh, the observations were made with the Lovell radio telescope at Georgia Bank. And at the moment, it is very much of a puzzle. And I promise you, we'll bring you more news about it as soon as we can. We will certainly do it a full sky at night to it. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the William Herschel Telescope. This is on the island of La Palma in the Canaries, and it is the third largest single mirror telescope in the world. The mirror is 165 inches in diameter. And obviously, the light grasp is absolutely tremendous. And it's just been used to locate a fascinating object. It appears to be a galaxy shining three hundred million, million times more brighter than our sun and something like 16,000 million light years away. And that makes it the most luminous object ever discovered. It hasn't in fact got a proper name at the moment. We merely call it RSF 10214 plus 4724. And there is a picture of it. It's indicated by the arrow and it looks very innocent, but it is anything but that. The discovery was actually made by a team from Queen Mary and Westfield College, headed by Professor Michael Rowan Robinson. And we are delighted that he's been able to join us again. Welcome back to the sky at night, Michael. Thank you. First of all, how did this come about? Well, we were using the William Herschel telescope to m measure the redshifts, and hence distances, of galaxies detected by the IRAS infrared astronomical satellite. IRAS was launched in 1983, and made a survey of the whole sky at far infrared wavelengths. This is a, a picture of the distribution on the sky of all the sources. And the band of white and blue across, across the middle is the stars of the Milky Way. Now, what my group and I have been doing for the past six years is studying the galaxies detected by IRAS, which are distributed all around the sky. And we've been using these to probe the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1989, the California Institute of Technology released a new catalogue of faint IRAS sources with a total of about 80,000 sources spread all around the sky. Here, here is the distribution of these sources, these galaxies on the sky. And I set up a collaboration of astronomers from Queen Mary and Westfield College London, from the universities of Oxford, Cambridge and Durham, and from Caltech. And we applied for time on the Isaac Newton and William Herschel telescopes to follow up a sample of about 1,400 of these galaxies. Uh, with the areas chosen were selected to be the very best possible in terms of IRS coverage and uh, low amounts of emission 
from interstellar dust. And the project took altogether about 40 nights of observing time. And by sheer chance, we in the sky at night were over there filming at just this moment. Yes, you were there during our, <laughs> our final run on the WHT, yes. And you very kindly let us film you when you were actually doing your work. And I remember that very well. Well, yes, uh, that's right. And uh, the sequence uh, here shows uh, Tom Broadhurst and I at work in the control room of the, of the William Herschel telescope. Uh, it shows very well how we operate. Uh, basically, we start off uh, with, with my selecting the next object to observe. Uh, I study the, the finding charts and also the log of what we've done before. Uh, Tom then types in the coordinates for the, of the object, and when the observations of the previous object finish, the telescope is commanded to the new position. When it arrives on the source position, we look at the field of view uh, with the TV guider, and we find the desired optical candidate on the TV screen. Mm -hmm. uh, we then move the telescope slightly to bring the object onto the slit of the spectrograph. This dark band is the spectrograph slit, wh where the spectrograph is taking light from. And this light is then spread out into all its constituent wavelengths. As soon as the galaxy is on the slit, we start the measurements. Um, I make a sketch to, so that we know which object we've uh, been observing. Uh, when the observations finish, the, auto auto the data automatically appear on a two-dimensional display and are then transferred to the data reduction computer where, where Tom selects which object to study, analyzes the spectrum and displays it on the screen. Meanwhile, the next object is already being observed and the whole cycle, in fact, takes just a few minutes for, per galaxy. Now, when we came to IRAS F10214, we had several candidates that, that might be the, the object. Uh, this shows the, our finding chart based on the Palomar Sky Survey photograph, which is a survey of the whole sky. And here we see several candidates. And in fact, the night before you filmed us, we'd observed object A and found that it was just a foreground star. In fact, that orange uh, ellipse there represents the area of uncertainty. Yeah, well, the orange ellipse is where we think the infrared source yes. is, yes, roughly. Uh, uh, then a, a couple of nights after you'd left, you'd left we uh, decided to look at object C. And uh, when we came to, to uh, uh, extract the spectrum, we found there had, in fact, been three objects on the slit. The star A, which we'd already observed, star C, well, object C, which turned out to be a foreground star, and another very faint object here. And the spectrum of this turned out to be rather unusual. It had an unusual pattern of emission lines, and we couldn't sort out what they were, but we realized they probably were redshifted. That's to say the object is moving away from us at, at great speed and is at great distance from us but so far we didn't know how, how, far, how fast it was moving. Uh, it was actually some months before the team tracked down uh, which object it was and what the redshift was. And the first thing we did was we got some colleagues at the uh, Mount Palomar 200 inch to take a, an image of the field. And when we did this, we, f uh, we found that there was a new object in between stars A and C, this one here, which we called object F. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had uh, an image made with the VLA, the Very Large Array Radio Telescope, in New Mexico. And this showed just a single source in the field of view, uh, which was located within one arc second of object F. Now, previously, we've always found that uh, infrared galaxies are also radio sources, and this source was just about the right strength. So then we knew we'd, we'd identify which was the correct uh, optical object which um, was associated with the infrared source. Now to understand the spectrum uh, we had to, uh, we realized that the, the spectral lines that we were seeing in, inf in the infrared had actually been shifted by about 230 percent from the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Once we were looking in the right place we could identify all the lines, here they are being identified with the atomic transitions of certain elements like carbon, neon, and so on. So in point of fact, if the object hadn't been moving away from us, those lines would have been right in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Yes, right. But because it's moving away so quickly, the wavelength has apparently lengthened, and it's shifted right across the optical spectrum into the infrared, which is where you saw it. Yes, that's right. Now, this meant that the object was incredibly distant, and in turn, that means it was very powerful. In fact, 
uh, 300 million million times the luminosity of the sun, or 30,000 times more powerful than the whole Milky Way galaxy. That's incredible. Uh, yes, and, and another extraordinary thing about this object is that 90%, uh, no, sorry, 99% of its power is coming out at infrared wavelengths, and only 1% is coming out at, in the optical and ultraviolet. Well, how do you explain that? Well, what we think is happening is that the uh, that the there is a, a power source hidden inside a huge cloud of dust, which absorbs the radiation from this source and re-emits it in the infrared. Then how, in fact, do you know it's a galaxy? Well, the optical image appears extended, uh, slightly extended, sort of a little bit fuzzy. We can see that it's not stellar. You can see that the object F is slightly fuzzy. The extent of this fuzz is, corresponds to the characteristic size of a galaxy. So we're pretty sure it's a galaxy. We just don't know what type of galaxy or what stage of evolution it's at. Well, clearly it was an exceptionally interesting one. Uh, what did you do next? Presumably you contacted other observers to see what they could find out? Yes, we, we uh, got a number of uh, colleagues on different telescopes to, to, to try to observe the object. One successful set of observations were made at Mauna Kea with uh, UKIRT. United the Kingdom Infrared Telescope. That's right. right up at 14,000 feet. That's and right. really is quite a place. Yes, indeed. And um, the the infrared image uh, that they took again showed that object F was, an ex was extended and, and almost certainly a galaxy. Uh, other observations um, made at the same time didn't fail to detect the source because it is uh, so extremely faint. Are but you observing it now? Well, at the moment, the source is behind the sun, uh, so we can't, can't be observed at uh, optical wavelengths. But uh, in a month's time, we expect when it re-emerges, we expect there will be a spate of new observations. Well, now for the vital question. This thing is incredibly luminous. There must be a kind of powerhouse inside it. What exactly is that powerhouse? Have you any idea? Well, we think there are two main possibilities. The first one is that it, there might be a quasar hidden inside a dusty galaxy. Now, normally quasars are blaze out visibly, but in this case we think it might... Here we see uh, the black hole in the middle, which is meant to be the quasar, radiating in the ultraviolet. And uh, then that radiation is absorbed by the, the dust of the galaxy and re-emitted in the infrared. Now, this is ver very unusual because it means the quasar is being seen very close to the moment it's switched on before it's had time to blow the dust and gas away. Well, I think some people may not be quite sure what quasars are. Can you amplify that a bit, please? Yes. Well, quasars are believed to be due to massive black holes in the middle of galaxies. And, when, and they light up when gas and dust falls into them. And what we tend to see is a compact source of optical, ultraviolet, and sometimes radio emission. So we could, in fact, be dealing with a quasar, but you said there was another possibility. What is that? Well, yes, the other possibility is that it's um, a, burst of, uh, a burst of massive star formation. In fact, we'd need to have altogether about a billion massive stars. Now, what we think it could be happening is, is clouds of gas and dust collide together when they do so, a burst of stars form, and the stars remain hidden in the dust and ra therefore radiate in the infrared. Now, the total energy required in this picture is so great that we think we we'd have to be talking about the formation of a massive galaxy. And uh, what is very exciting is the possibility that what we're witnessing is the, the moment when most of the heavy elements in a galaxy are formed. That's to say, the stuff we're made of is being formed, perhaps, at this moment in this object. So there are, in fact, two possibilities, either the quasar or the starburst theory. Uh, can you distinguish between them at the moment? I mean, have you got enough evidence either way? No, at the moment, we, we can't distinguish between them because uh, our observations don't distinguish between the predictions of the two models. Here's our observation shown as the, the white crosses and arrows, and the two models both, uh, are both consistent with what we've observed so far. So, so far, we can't tell the difference, but we hope to, to shortly distinguish between them. <laughs> Which do you favour? Well, I personally favour the, uh, the galaxy in formation idea, mainly because it's more exciting and revolutionary. I don't have <laughs> strong grounds for it yet. There's one interesting point. This object is very remote, therefore we're seeing it as it used to be a very long time ago. Its light has taken a long time to reach us. Now, I think most people agree that the universe began in its present form with a Big Bang. How soon after the Big Bang are we seeing this object? Uh, about 2 billion years, that's 2,000 million years, compared with the present age of the universe, 
of uh, 13 billion years. So uh, the, the, the rough sequence of events we have at, at t equals zero here, the Big Bang, and then uh, the most distant objects we see are the quasars uh, around a redshift of five, and that must also be the moment when the first galaxies form, and we think elliptical galaxies must have formed about that time. Then around redshift two, or two to three, we think that spiral galaxies formed, and it's therefore rather significant that IRS F10214 is seen at redshift 2. We think, uh, I think this could be a spiral galaxy in the process of formation. Well then, uh, the, coming on later in time and, and to lower redshifts, we see the, the most distant galaxy clusters we know about at present around a redshift of 1. And then uh, at still nearer distances and more recent times, we, we, we can look back to the origin of the solar system 4.5 billion years ago. Well, so far, this object is in a class of its own. Are you searching for others of the same kind? Well, yes, we certainly are. We've started a program that over the next couple of years uh, should lead to the discovery of, of other objects of this, of this type, if they exist. It's not so easy because it, it, it was one of the faintest IRS sources detected, and also it was below the Palomar sky, sky surface, so it's quite a hard task to find some more. So you need very large telescopes, such as the William Herschel. Indeed. Well, what's your next step? Well, we want to prove that the infrared radiation really is coming from dust, and we're doing this with observations at radio and uh, submillimeter wavelengths. In fact, the radio, we had radio observations at the VLA last week. Uh, the next thing we want to do is to uh, see if there is, really is a quasar hidden inside, it, inside this dust cloud. And the best place to look for this is in the near infrared, where we can penetrate through the dust. Finally, of course, we must find more examples to tell us whether this is a, a general phenomenon in the life of galaxies or whether this is just a freak. I imagine you were really excited when you realized what you'd found. Oh, yes, certainly. It was <laughs> extraordinary. How significant is it, do you think? Well, it could be very significant. If this is a galaxy in the process of formation, then this would be uh, perhaps the most interesting extragalactic object found since the discovery of the first quasar, 3C273, 30 years ago. How soon will it be, do you think, before you really know more about it? I think in the next six months we will, we will be learning a lot more. I hope so. Well, many congratulations. I think it does just show the power of the William Herschel Telescope. And, of course, also, you've got to know just how to use it. Michael, thank you very much. You're so this is an exciting and a significant discovery, and we'll bring you more news when we can. Meanwhile, next month, I'm going to turn to something entirely different. We've heard a great deal about the Hubble Space Telescope, and we all know about its faulty mirror. It's not perfect, we know that. On the other hand, it is sending back superb results, and it's by no means the failure that some people have tried to make out. I've been over to the Space Telescope Science Institute at Baltimore, so we'll be able to bring you the latest news from Hubble, and that we'll do in our next program. Meanwhile, don't forget our Sky at Night information line. And this gives you the latest news about astronomy, and we try and keep it as up-to-date as we can. So ring up this new number, which is 0898 666 North North North. Calls charge 36 pence per minute cheap rate, 48 pence per minute other times, or you can dial up CFAX page 616. And so, until next month, good night.